to this event. It's my first time. Um, I usually um, work in academic circles and sometimes venture into the real world in order to um, uh, create a link between what we study in the high towers of academia and what is actually going on in the real world. So for a very long time, there has been a connection between my political views and my academic work. I have worked uh, as a, a, a lecturer first and professor at King's College, and my area of specialization is Saudi Arabia, my original country. Um, in December, January um, last, um, all of us, I think, in the world were astonished by uh, historical events that uh, probably is going to change the face of the Arab world. We are just at the beginning and uh, a lot of uh, events and uh, changes will actually uh, become apparent with time. I think uh, from my point of view, it's very premature to speak about success and failure of the so-called Arab Spring. But I think uh, that uh, cataclysmic event of Bu Azizi uh, burning himself shocked many people in the Arab world and uh, in the West and triggered off, uh, uh, it was an event actually that triggered off this domino effect. But the structural forces, the causes of what happened in Tunisia, later on in Egypt, now in uh, Libya, in Syria, in Bahrain, in Yemen, and possibly many other places uh, to come, uh, had some deep-rooted problems. And everybody talked about Arab dictatorships and Arab authoritarian regime. And many people here in the West ask them, asked themselves, oh, there is an Arab exceptionalism. And this Arab exceptionalism was translated as tolerance for dictatorship and inability to go beyond this authoritarian regime and challenge them on the ground. And some people uh, uh, volunteered some explanations. Uh, for example, one of the most bizarre explanations that I heard was that Islam is really not compatible with democracy. And therefore, the reason why the Arab world lagged behind it's because its Islamic tradition does not foster that kind of critical thinking, liberalism, individualism. It's a communitarian society that does not or is not conducive to the development of democracy. And we come to January and the million of people who gathered in Tahrir Square in Egypt proved all those kind of uh, 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 people who volunteered these opinions wrong. The people in Tahrir Square proved that they have dreams exactly like us here in the West. They may be different, their skin may be darker than us, but they actually have the same dreams. They all want to be respected as individuals, as human beings, with serious human rights, civil and political rights. And as such, they, were, uh, they basically had enough of the corruption that was going on in Egypt, the sort of um, development that uh, Mubarak flaunted in Egypt, which benefited a, a small minority of his coterie and deprived the rest of the Egyptian society of a livelihood. So this Arab Spring that we call today Arab Spring, it seemed after Egypt that there are three options for these other Arabs who haven't succeeded in overthrowing their dictators and dismantling not only the dictator but the regime that these dictators have uh, established consisting of their family, kin, relatives and even outsiders and I'll come to that in a minute. First, the first option is to continue to resist these dictators and bear the consequences of prolonged bloodshed. And this is exactly what happened. We have situations now in Yemen, in Syria, and in Bahrain that attest to this choice. That people have continued to struggle, even today, every Friday and every day, we find people going on, um, to the streets and asking for their basic rights. Then there is the second one, the threat or the risk that these countries, once the dictator is gone, they will actually disintegrate, they go into a, a deep, prolonged civil war, sectarian uh, divisions, etc. 
and also the threat of terrorism. And these kind of arguments we've heard when Mubarak and Ben Ali were uh, uh, trying to hold to the last, uh, the last minute, they were threatening their own society with civil war. It's either the dictator or civil war or civil strife. But in fact, we know that the dictators themselves were actually part of the machinery that created divisions within societies. And then we come to the third option that we have a clear example of in Libya. Well, the dictator is there, we start a revolution, we can't go uh, ahead with it, and what happens? We invite foreign intervention. And this is actually one of the main difference between what happened in Tunisia and uh, Egypt and uh, the Libyan case that is still ongoing. Of course, there is also the story of international sanctions on uh, local regimes. We've seen that with uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, we've seen it with uh, other um, uh, uh, authoritarian regimes. But now, after 10 years of the war on terror and the withdrawal of American troops or the prospect of withdrawal from Iraq and possibly in Afghanistan, we've got to find a job for NATO, and that is supporting um, the so-called rebels. Now, in Tunisia and Egypt, the two success stories so far, we find that the power of the people dismantled regimes that had deprived them of their basic human rights, impoverished huge sections of the population, and enriched uh, corrupt uh, minority. In Syria and Yemen, the struggle continues without a resolution being achieved. Yet both Yemenis and Syrians are determined to continue their struggle this, despite their heavy losses. In Libya, NATO intervention provided an umbrella to push for the overthrow of Gaddafi. In this respect, we wait to see the outcome of the Libyan new chapter. And I think uh, the intervention on behalf of the rebels will, by NATO will create uh, uh, conditions that perhaps, I would say, are not so conducive to a democratic outcome. But let's talk about something or an area that is close to my home country, and that is Bahrain. Uh, the suppression of the pro-democracy movement in Bahrain was done locally. Uh, it was done as the Saudi, the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, together with other Gulf uh, Cooperation Council countries, backed by the silence of the international community, mainly Western countries, succeeded in a counter-revolutionary move that killed the prospect of Bahrainis achieving their dreams, at least at the moment. Saudi Arabia considered its move a victory over Iran uh, or Iranian influence in the region. Most importantly, the regime could not tolerate the fall of a Gulf ruling family, as this might uh, facilitate a domino effect in the, in the area that would end the rule of emirates, monarchies, and protectorates. Basically, these countries, I would consider them as oil and gas companies rather than uh, states or sovereign states. This mixed outcome of the Arab Spring, which is at its beginning, I must add, um, we have not actually reached the end of it, and it, it will continue to be an evolving process. But this kind of um, situation that I have outlined with the main three options that people had in the Arab world, I think there is a fourth option, and this is maybe the point that I would like to put and perhaps discuss with you. The fourth point, the fourth alternative that the region has today is to push for the West to stop supporting dictatorships to begin with before the moment of their downfall comes. This has happened through selling them arms, through investment, and through silence on the abuse of their, uh, of their record on human rights. And the argument in the West is based on realism. I remember once I was talking to a British diplomat and I was talking about uh, uh, Saudi and British citizens being tortured in Saudi prisons. And I said to him, uh, this was at the time when the nurses uh, case uh, was uh, actually uh, hot in the British media. 
And he said, well, we know that there's torture in Saudi prisons. We know that even our own citizens are tortured in Saudi prison, but we don't want to make a big issue out of it. It's definitely not an issue of uh, foreign policy. We have our own ways of dealing with these situations. So basically, this kind of attitude, this kind of support, even um, at the level of exposure um, of certain practices in these uh, countries and regimes, um, must stop. Um, and above all, this uh, uh, quest and search for arms uh, deals and opportunities in order to uh, uh, improve the economy or at times of international, of international economic crisis, we have just weapons to sell. And ironically, today I think there is an exhibition uh, on uh, arms in London, hosted here in London, to demonstrate the sophistication of all the weapons that many, many dictators in the Arab world, or the surviving one, would actually use in order to suppress their own people. So, in a way, this history of supporting these Arab dictators that the West has maintained become allow them to become accomplices in the crimes against the people of these countries where these dictatorships have survived and they have survived because of that support. We are told by the press that the Libyan dictator was actually in contact with MI6 until the last minute and therefore it is very difficult to break this cycle, this uh, dependence, interdependency between the West and these Arab dictators. Um, of course, there is the problem of realism and pragmatism and, uh, that dictate policy uh, rather than idealism and moral considerations. But there is a limit to this realism. There is a limit to this moral bankruptcy when it comes to witnessing uh, and becoming accomplices in suppressing other people's dreams. And we here in the West are providing the means by which these Arab dictators do it. The, un the answer um, uh, to this cycle, vicious cycle of dependency that has gone too, for too long, too far, is to actually convince people here in the West, people who we come across, we interact with on a daily basis, that it is in the West's best national interest to cut these regimes off from support, from military equipment, in order to actually achieve a, a better national security in the West. We do not expect people here in London to worry about the dead in Libya, or the dead in Saudi Arabia, or the tortured prisoners in... Uh, uh, that is probably too much to expect. But we can ask them to start thinking about how it is in our best national interest here in London not to support these regimes in these countries. The West must understand that authoritarianism, corruption, and lack of transparency may facilitate um, small financial interest, but in the long term, it is counterproductive. We have learned hard lessons in New York and London that being on the side of dictators is not a productive long-term strategy. It can backfire and threatens our livelihood, here, our livelihood here in London. These regimes have been incubators where terrorism thrives and undermines security around the globe. The example of Saudi Arabia is revealing. I've only got a minute probably. Two minutes, but let me just discuss this one case that I know better than other cases. Saudi Arabia, it is a regime that was held responsible for nourishing one of the most violent trends uh, within the Islamic tradition, and that is the jihadi tradition. But when, after 9 11, it was absolved completely from any responsibility, and it was quickly rehabilitated in London and in Washington. Uh, as an old ally with whom we have a special relationship. So the regime actually was successful through quite a lot of uh, money and oil wealth to turn itself from an incubator of terrorism to a victim of terrorism. And not only that, there were people here in London telling us that we must learn from the Saudis how to de-radicalize people. So the, the incubator of terrorism 
succeeds in becoming a victim of terrorism and starts giving lessons to us here in London about how we should combat terrorism. And the same thing happens in the United Nations, when the United Nations wants to learn from Saudi ways uh, about how to combat terrorism. So this full circle, this vicious circle that we can't get out of, is because successive Western governments continue to cherish this close and special relationship with a regime that is today acting as a counter-revolutionary force, thwarting many dreams, not only in, in my own country, but in neighboring countries, such as in Yemen and in Bahrain. So lifting that silence on the excesses of this regime and many others in, in the region, and uh, without endearing them with uh, lavish military contracts to boost their coercive powers, we might actually begin to have a fourth option that does not require NATO to come and bomb innocent people. So this fourth option is extremely important in my opinion, and it is important not only for the people in the, in the Arab world, but also people in the West, um, for countries like Britain too. The West cannot be held hostage to the whims of a corrupt pottery ruling without legitimacy because the corruption, in a way, is contagious. And we have seen some cases, important cases, where arms uh, uh, deals resulted in implicating people here in Britain, but investigations obviously were stopped. So I, I will stop here, and I think the lesson to be learned from this Arab Spring that um, uh, 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 Toppling uh, dictatorships without intervention by NATO or any other foreign um, uh, power um, depends on this fourth option. And it is time, I think, for the West and Western countries to behave like democracies rather than a police force.